Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Caspian Policy Center. Uh, welcome to our uh, new event. Uh, I'm Afghan Nifty, uh, Executive Director of the Caspian Policy Center. Our uh, report called The Vital Resource, Water Management in Central Asia. That's the report that we will be presenting today. Uh, and this event is primarily about the report. I would like to welcome all our speakers, all our audience from the region as well. And I want to welcome our Ambassador Masters here for uh, moderating the discussion. Uh, our report is written by uh, our research assistants here, uh, Ajan and uh, Jeremy Cohen, and uh, I'd like to welcome them on the event as well. Um, I I'd like to say a few words before I turn the floor to our moderator. Uh, Central Asia's scarcity of water resources pose critical questions for the region's future. As climate change leads to decreases in precipitation and, and higher levels of evaporation, Central Asia's water in intensive agriculture practices must be carefully examined. The region's unequal distribution of water and resource, uh, energy resources has often brought upstream and downstream countries into conflict. As water resources dwindle and demands for energy increase, addressing these issues will be vital for the region's stability. With these threats growing by the year, cooperation on a meaningful level will be essential to managing the water resources responsibly and fairly. Today at the Caspian Policy Center, we are convening leading academic and policy experts to discuss the threats to Central Asia's water supply and potential solutions to the problems. Once again, um, as the head of the Caspian Policy Center, I'd like to welcome all of you to this uh, important discussion. I believe we'll have to extend the discussion to the caucuses in our future events as well, since uh, Central Asia has its own particular character, 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 characteristics that we have to address separately. So at this point, uh, I would like to uh, invite our Ambassador uh, Mustard uh, to start uh, moderating the discussion and welcome the uh, speakers as well. Ambassador Mustard is our advisory board member and he served, he has extensive State Department career and uh, I'm very happy to have him on board with this event. Uh, he served as an ambassador in Turkmenistan, one of the important countries in the region. And uh, here I'd like to have the floor for Ambassador Master. Okay, well, thank you, Afghan. Um, I wanna remind everybody of uh, a famous quote from the American author, Mark Twain, who said uh, that whiskey is for drinking, but water is for fighting. And the whole point of what we're trying to accomplish oftentimes is to keep water from turning into something that people fight over. Um, water management in Central Asia is a critical topic as Afghan has pointed out. And of course, uh, the entire issue has been compounded over the last few years by climate change. And for that reason, we have uh, assembled a panel of experts to talk about this problem within the context of uh, the Caspian Policy Center's new paper, which was authored by Aijan Abdelgazina, a researcher with our energy and economic program. I'm very proud to say that she is a graduate of a United States uh, land grant institution, uh, Penn State. Um, and uh, she's not the only one on the panel as we shall soon see. Um, after she presents the paper, uh, the first person to offer an intervention will be uh, Philip Saprikin of the United Nations Regional Center for Preventive Diplomacy in uh, Central Asia, based in Ashgabat, Turkmenistan. Philip is a very experienced uh, Russian diplomat who has had uh, a great deal of, of experience in Central Asia. Uh, and uh, his current work with UNRICA has a particular focus on water and preventing conflicts around water. Uh, the next speaker will be Ruby Shamila from the US Agency of, uh, for International Development's Water and Environment Team. Uh, I should have pointed out Philippe is, is beaming in from Ashgabat. Uh, Ruby is beaming in from uh, Almaty. Uh, Ruby uh, is another land grant institution alumna. Uh, in addition to having studied at the University of Jordan and at George Washington University, she also holds a degree from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Um, after Ruby speaks, we will hear as well from Dr. Kakraman Jumboyev of the International Water Management Institute in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. He has studied at Humboldt University in Berlin, at Bern University, 
and at the Indian Institute of Technology in Roorkee. Um, our final speaker will be Dr. Muradbek Laljabayev, Assistant Professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences of the University of Central Asia in uh, Tajikistan. He holds a PhD from Cornell, yet another US land grant institution. And uh, he uh, also holds degrees from the Kuan Yu Lee School, Lee, Lee Kuan Yu School of Public Policy of the National University of Singapore and uh, Horog State University in Tajikistan. I want to inform all panelists, you each have five minutes to make your comments and interventions. Um, I will cut you off at five minutes. Uh, and uh, taking a page from the presidential debates, uh, we will hit the mute button if necessary. Uh, for the audience, I want to tell the audience there is a Q&A feature in Zoom. So please use that to pose your questions. If you have a question, simply go into the Q&A. Um, I will then go through the questions and present them to members of the panel. So I think we're ready to get started. Aijan, would you please present the paper? Sure. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the Caspian Policy Center for giving me an opportunity to speak at today's event and uh, to be working on such a very important topic in Central Asia. I've also put together a presentation that gives an idea of what the policy brief is about. So if we could just share the screen. Uh, the next slide, please. Yeah. So there are five major river basins in Central Asia, and the main sources of water in the region are the Sirdaria and Amudaria rivers, you, which you can see on the map here. This transboundary nature of water resources, coupled with an uneven distribution of water and energy resources between upstream countries, which are Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, and downstream countries, which are Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan, often result in conflict and interest as to when and in what quantities water needs to be released from the reservoirs. The downstream countries um, prioritize the upstream countries prioritize releasing water in winter to generate much needed electricity, while the downstream countries are concerned that such a practice uh, might endanger their summer irrigation. So as a result, we could see how water mismanagement can pose both energy security threats in the upstream and food security threats in the downstream countries. Um, the next slide, please. There are some other factors uh, that uh, put additional strain on water resources. Given that Central Asia is an agricultural producer, heavy reliance on flood irrigation, especially in the absence of proper drainage systems, leads to lower water quality, soil salinization, water logging, and soil erosion. So the picture on the background of the slide is a good illustration of this problem. And this picture was actually taken by a moderator today in Bastion Mustard when he was in Turkmenistan. And it shows how excessive concentrations of water in the absence of well-functioning drainage system can adversely affect the soil and lead to soil salinization. Cotton production is another thing. So cotton production is still dominant in some countries of Central Asia, especially on Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. And it has a very high water footprint contributes to soil erosion, as well as to the water pollution through the extensive use of uh, pesticides and fertilizers. The policy brief also addresses a question of climate change, which is another problem that results in um, dramatic drops in water levels. And uh, while the melting of glaciers also risk, uh, raise the risk of flooding and dam failures. Um, the next slide, please. If not addressed properly, water mismanagement um, can have serious implications for the economic, social, and environmental stability of the region. Reduced water supply in combination with uh, poor irrigation systems results in around 2.1 billion in economic costs in Central Asia. Disruptions in agricultural production also result in job losses and pose severe threats to the food security in the affected regions. Water management has also led to the shrinking of the Aral Sea, which is named as one of the world's worst environmental disasters. And it also leads to polluted dust storms that also cause respiratory diseases in populations living nearby. Uh, the next slide, please. So um, our, our policy brief also offers some recommendations for improving the water management uh, in the region. One of them is to introduce better irrigation practices through the adoption of sprinkler and drip irrigation techniques. Um, the next one is to diversify um, 
away from cotton towards more viable alternatives that require that don't require as much water. And actually, as we can see on the graph here, uh, this graph illustrates how much water you need to produce $100 worth of crops. And we could see how production of um, fruits and vegetables, particularly tree nuts and tree fruits, um, is um, their uh, water footprint is uh, lower than the footprint of cotton production. That's why we should um, like kind of divert our attention more towards producing them instead of cotton production. Because and the export to the um, Arab states and the Western Europe will also generate more revenues at the same time. Uh, we could also see, for example, that the amount of water needed to produce $100 worth of cotton is 12 times higher than for lemons and 24 times higher than for tomatoes. And um, finally, it is also important to encourage interstate dialogue um, that should focus on development and functional legal frameworks that will provide clear guidelines on how to efficiently manage water, uh, regional water management. And um, this is basically the um, very brief uh, overview of the policy brief, but um, I would really encourage you to go to the Caspian Policy Center's website and um, read the report. And also, I think the link for the report will also be provided in the chat window um, and will be sent to your emails later on. So yeah, I think my five minutes are up to you. So back to you, Ambassador Master. Thank you. Uh, that was excellent, Aijan. And I thank you for staying within the bounds of time. Uh, that sets the stage for our next speaker, who will be uh, my old friend from Ashgabat, uh, Philippe Saprikin. Philippe, over to you. Yes. So thank you very much, uh, uh, for dear colleagues. I'm not that so talented, so to speak short, as the Russian writer, Mr. Chekhov said, but I'll try to do my best <laughs> to fit into the five minutes. Um, well, uh, but let me thank, first of all, the Captain Policy Center for this initiative uh, to organize this event. Uh, well, uh, transboundary water management has been a, a long-standing issue among Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan, partly including Afghanistan. And the transboundary nature of two rivers that were mentioned in the previous um, presentation means that their efficient use and peaceful management depend on regional dialogue cooperation and trust. Uh, water and environment overlaps with many other contentious issues, including energy, water, food nexus, socioeconomic development, peace and prosperity. Um, none of this can be addressed without ensuring the optimal use of existing water resources and addressing climate change in the long run. Despite the great efforts, no durable or sustainable framework for managing transboundary water has been agreed among the countries since they achieved their independence. Uh, during the recent years, Central Asia experiences positive changes in, in the regional dynamics owing to a demonstrated political will of the leaders of five states uh, to jointly tackle issues of current regional agenda, which, they, which is truly commendable. Uh, a number of important bilateral agreements and arrangements have been uh, in place over the recent past. Moreover, um, um, Central Asia General Assembly Resolution 72, uh, 283 on strengthening regional and international cooperation to ensure peace, stability, and sustainable development was adopted and provides a, a good platform to, uh, well, for the countries to uh, improve or to enhance this dialogue. Um, and uh, perhaps the most important sign of positive trend in the regional relations was the convening of the consultative meeting on Central Asian heads of state uh, uh, was last November. Uh, this was the second regional summit in many years after nearly a decade of none. Uh, during the summit, the heads of states discussed all of the issues on the regional agenda and began making plans to strengthen their cooperation in the future. One more important element uh, that I wanted to draw your attention to is adoption of the Caspian Convention 2018 was a clear manifestation of the proverb where there is a will, there is a way. Although, uh, well, the repairing uh, countries and issues surrounding the Caspian Basin and the ROC Basin are, are not the same. However, the adoption of, of the Caspian Convention shows clearly that the regional ag agreement is quite possible, even on the most difficult issues. So, 
uh, both Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan have important experience in negotiating this convention, and they may be able to share it with, with other countries and uh, to ensure that this process also is ongoing in the ROC basis. Um, the United Nations Norwegian Center for Preventive Diplomacy, UNRK, as Ambassador Martha said, UNRCCA, as we call it here, <laughs> in particular, have been uh, a committed partner to all Central Asian states um, in transforming the region into a model of peace, security, and sustainable development. So we began to focus on uh, transboundary rewards in 2010 with the aim of supporting five states of the region in the search for mutually acceptable agreements that would provide a durable legal framework for managing the region's water. Uh, in 2019, we have launched a water project um, with, um, for three years, was streamlining the water, energy, and environment dialogue between the states of the region. And the project would focus on three main uh, streams. So, uh, well, work stream, preventive diplomacy, confidence building, second, strengthening institutional and legal framework, and third, enhancing relations and promoting partnership. As lesson learned in 2019, it became clear that the interest uh, among the five states of the region uh, to find pragmatic and practical solutions to, to regional water management uh, was growing. Um, and your CCA would therefore need to focus on elements of regional cooperation in this area, which are more applicatory, uh, down to earth and less politicized. Which, enable, which could enable us to engage more efficiently. Uh, for example, uh, uh, recently our center has been working with the decision makers of five states on the creation of the ad hoc expert group on legal and, and institutional aspects of water energy cooperation. Philippe, I'm, 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 sorry, but, but okay. I'm sorry, but we've run out of time. We have to move to the next okay. speaker. But yes. thank you for that. Okay. Well, I'm nearly done. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much. We'll have time in the Q&A to come back to some of these because I have my own questions I want to ask. Um, the uh, next speaker is uh, Ruby Shamila from the USAID uh, Water and Environmental Team uh, coming in from Almaty. So please, Ruby, over to you in five minutes, please. Sure, I'll set my timer on. Um, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Mustard. Uh, good morning and good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to sit on this panel today to highlight the critical and vital resource of water, water that is key to Central Asia's stability and economy. So first, let me introduce US, USAID to those who might not be familiar with our agency. USAID is the development arm of the US government. It is responsible for overseeing um, US foreign aid and development assistance. Uh, we work in almost 100 uh, countries, including all Central Asian uh, countries. Now, uh, the strategy that guides our assistance on water in the region is the United States Central Asia strategy that uh, came out er uh, earlier this year, last February. Uh, the US government's primary strategic interest in the region is to build a more stable and prosperous Central Asia that is free to pursue political, economic, and security interests with a variety of partners on its own terms. So uh, because water is a foundational element of development, and it is cross-cutting into many sectors, such as energy, agriculture, tourism. Um, USAID's uh, Economic Development Office has been providing assistance on water for almost two decades. Uh, and our main objective on water is to strengthen regional cooperation on transboundary water resources. Uh, so now, uh, to be able to understand the opportunities and challenges in the region, uh, we need to understand the context of the water sector. Uh, almost 90% of Central Asia's rivers are transboundary. Uh, and for example, uh, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan, uh, which are uh, downstream countries, rely on their neighbors for water resources. Uh, and, and those neighbors are the upstream countries of Tajikistan, the Kyrgyz Republic, and I want to include Afghanistan in here. So for example, 90% of Uzbekistan's water originates outside of the country. And uh, that's 97% for Turkmenistan. So if we, if, we, if we put it in context, 97% of the water that is currently in Turkmenistan originates outside its borders, and that's why this uh, resource is so strategic. Uh, so most countries are not self-sufficient, and all of them rely on external sources to fulfill their needs. Uh, because of this, the diminishing water resources can be a trigger for conflict in the region. And un unfortunately, it was. 
Uh, but as a colleague from the government of Turkmenistan mentioned recently in a meeting, uh, that transboundary rivers should not be seen only as triggers of conflict. Uh, those rivers carry the history and culture of the region, and they are what bind uh, all of the Central Asian countries together. So that's another way to look at uh, transboundary rivers. Uh, USAID understands the importance of water, energy, and agriculture nexus. And just last month, uh, USAID launched its uh, new $24 million five-year uh, transboundary water project. Um, the project uh, uh, proposes solutions to the transboundary water challenges in the region uh, by looking at those challenges through the water, energy, and food security uh, uh, nexus lens, and also by highlighting with data and modeling uh, the economic benefits of water cooperation. And, and that last point is, is, is very important because uh, we need to demonstrate by data that cooperating uh, among each other would bring benefits to, to all of the countries uh, that share transboundary rivers. So uh, our uh, water and vulnerable environment uh, project uh, will target both the Amudaria and the Sirdaria basins to improve regional water cooperation and practices. Uh, we will sustain and scale up Basin Council at Transboundary Rivers and build the technical capacity of water stakeholders and institutions um, to also look at the water through those two lenses, the water, energy, food security nexus and the economic benefits of cooperation, which is unfortunately not how water is addressed uh, currently in the region. Uh, we will also support the transboundary cooperation initiatives, especially at the ministerial level. Uh, now, I want to highlight the economic value of water cooperation. Uh, solutions cannot be found in the water sector alone. We need to promote, to promote and establish uh, water as a key factor of sustainable economic development in the region. Uh, everyone agrees that the future uh, prosperity uh, and stability of the region is fully dependent on water. And again, that's, that's uh, one of the main goals of USAID and the US government. Uh, in the region. Uh, thank you. I think um, I'm almost uh, within my time. Ruby, that was excellent. And uh, I'm going to have a follow-up question uh, when we get to the Q&A. Uh, but uh, thank you for staying within the time boundary and uh, giving us a lot of food for thought. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Kakraman Jumboyev of the International Water Management Institute in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. Over to you, sir. Uh, good morning, dear participants. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Caspian Policy Center for giving me opportunity to uh, speak in this uh, important event. And uh, I am based actually in Tashkent, in Uzbekistan. Uh, I work for IMI Central uh, International Water Management Institute, uh, Central Asia office. IMI is a research for development uh, organization. We have offices in certain countries and uh, our uh, scientists operate in more than 30 countries. Our vision is uh, a water secure world and our mission is uh, provide uh, uh, science and evidence-based water solutions for climate resilient development. <laughs> and IMI is active in Central Asia since 2001, and uh, we have implemented more than 30 projects related to water energy, food nexus, uh, transboundary water cooperation, and also uh, institutional analysis, integrated water resource management, and uh, also assessment of water productivity in irrigated agriculture. Uh, I think uh, current state of uh, energy and uh, future use of energy in Central Asia very much depends on efficient and rational use of water resources. Uh, as already previous speakers mentioned that there is now competition is increasing for water use in energy sector, agriculture sector. And we know that more than 80% of water use it in agriculture. Therefore, uh, we have to think about how to reduce, you know, uh, water and energy consumption in irrigated agriculture. For example, RLC is home more than uh, 9 uh, million hectare irrigated area, and more than 30% of that area is under pump irrigation. For example, in Uzbekistan, more than 50% of irrigated area under pump operation, uh, pump irrigated area, and uh, this uh, area consumes about 21% of total available energy of the country, or Tajikistan, for example. 
uh, about 40% uh, of irrigated area under pump operations, and it consumes uh, about 16% of total available energy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, policies and strategies of Central Asian countries are, you know, uh, directed to resource abstraction rather than, you know, sustainable use or improving uh, if, uh, efficient uh, use uh, of these resources. Uh, along these lines, our institute is carrying out several projects. Uh, I would like to call uh, one of the, I would like to give one of, one of our uh, one example from our project, which is called mitigating competition for water in Amudari and Sirdari River Basin by improving water energy use efficiency. This project is financed by US, US, USID uh, peer program. Peer stands for partnership for enhancement engagement in research. And uh, uh, the results uh, uh, in this project, we are looking at uh, water energy use in uh, pump irrigated areas in Central Asia. And uh, our study results indicated that we are over applying water in pump irrigated areas, in lift irrigated areas in Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, if uh, in, under current scenario, under traditional irrigation practices. If we shift, uh, improve uh, irrigation techniques and uh, you know uh, introduce uh, like uh, sprinkler irrigation or drip irrigation or other technologies uh, we can reduce about 30 percent of water uh, water on farm level and also about 30 percent of energy in uh, lift irrigated areas and also significantly reduce carbon emissions from lift irrigated areas for example in Uzbekistan about 80% of energy uh, is generated using coal and natural gas, uh, which is associated with carbon emissions. And when we looked at, you know, in Central Asia, uh, attributed carbon emissions to lift irrigated area, it was about 2 million tons uh, only for Uzbekistan. So we have shared this research, our uh, research project findings with our key ministries and uh, decision makers organized policy dialogue workshops and uh, recently government of Uzbekistan introduced a subsidy program for uh, improved on farm irrigation practices such as drip irrigation and government is now covering about 50 percent of uh, uh, drip irrigation cost and uh, ex exempting farmers who those implemented drip irrigation from land tax uh, in the uh, next five years. So, it, which is also a very good incentive. And uh, in addition, uh, we have been also working on uh, small hydropower plants, you know, uh, introduction of small hydropower plants in transboundary rivers, in canals, you know, which does not affect hydrological regimes of rivers and canals, you know. And uh, this is also good potential, you know, to reduce and mitigate, uh, you know, energy pressure, you know, in Central Asian region. And uh, furthermore, EME is also demonstrated uh, solar uh, power. Dr. Dr. Jambayev, I'm sorry, but uh, yeah. at we, the end we've of hit the five speech, minute mark. Yeah. At the end of my speech, I would like to state that there is, if we improve irrigation efficiency, we can significantly reduce water energy use intensity in irrigated agriculture. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for those comments. I will have a, at least one follow-up question on on your remarks, and I thank you very much. Uh, we will now go to our last speaker, uh, Professor Moradbek Laljabayev, uh, who is coming in to us from Dushanbe, I believe. Is that correct? Uh, Dushanbe is the time, but I'm based up in the mountains of the Pamir, so from Horog oh, joining. Lovely. You're actually yes. up in Horog, so okay. Over to you, Professor. Uh, thanks very much for having me. Thanks uh, the Caspian Policy Center for the invitation. It's been great uh, uh, listening to our esteemed colleagues uh, discuss the water management issues. Uh, frankly, the points that I was going to make, pretty much uh, most of them have been covered. And so I would like to just stay on the two, um, which uh, the first one, uh, which I think all of you are familiar, is the politics of it. Uh, the politics do play a major role. There's been so many analyses out there. 
And yet, uh, at the end of the day, we've seen that most of the cooperation in, um, or non-cooperation in the Central Asian context uh, does end up, after all, on the personalities, whether the high-level politicians get along with each other. And so the most recent case of the change uh, between uh, the, in the relations between uh, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan speaks volumes about uh, what it means to be cooperating and non-cooperating and the role of the individuals uh, in this particular process. Obviously, there's a lot of work done um, regarding you know, the agency, uh, et cetera, whether the institutions are stable enough uh, to go forward. But then again, um, even looking at in the United, the United States and what goes on uh, at the presidential level, still, you know, personalities do um, have a lot of leverage in the politics. And so then, you know, I would be wondering um, genuinely that when, when things like this happen and there's a change of presidents, change of leaders, change of prime ministers, whatnot, uh, do we really have these stable institutions to carry things forward? Or do we really, are we really at the mercy of the, um, of the change if it happens or whether it happens, or like in the case of Kyrgyzstan, we make it happen. Um, but then again, everything gets um, hijacked, but I'm digressing obviously here uh, a little bit. So that's the point number one. Point number two is going off of uh, uh, Professor Jumaboyev's uh, point about the role of agriculture in the pumps. Um, with a colleague um, of mine at the Nazarbayev University, we've done a little sketch paper on uh, the situation in Tajikistan. Pretty much the data that was cited is, is very similar. And what we've done is we've taken a next step um, in building some scenarios. And the scenarios were uh, eventually, uh, I mean, essentially saying that, okay, we have this problem in agriculture. It's uh, continuously indebted to the power sector. Uh, keeps on uh, um, not paying uh, uh, taxes because, again, uh, it's not being able to be productive. And at the end of the two, three, five years, then the government pretty much run, uh, writes off all of the debt. And so that's uh, incurring so much of the fiscal issues and whatnot. Um, how about if these uh, agriculture um, areas that are not really efficient and they're using these pumps, um, why not put them um, to a hold, let's say for a period of five years, that's what we've done uh, in terms of the, a little bit of a uh, scenario building, very simple, just some numbers on um, how much power is being produced, uh, what is the level of debt, et cetera, et cetera. If anyone's interested, the paper is out there. You can see it for yourself. But at the end of the day, the scheme is where is you know you you save this energy in the agriculture sector. We have a very viable export of energy to Afghanistan um, at premium prices, and so if agreements could be made, this saved energy that goes to, for export to Afghanistan, the revenues should come back to pay for the debt, but also the um, extra remaining and there there is extra remaining the way we calculate it goes into the rehabilitation of the agriculture. You know, wh whether you want to do the canals or the dripping or whatever you want to do. And so gradually as the model turns out, um, the agricultural sector may actually come uh, positive and in the green, of course, assuming that the export will happen and the energy sector will be willing to give back the money to the agricultural sector. So then here we go into the uh, sectoral level. So those are the two points that I wanted to make, but um, I look forward to the conversation going forward in the discussion part. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that. And um, I, I personally would like to get a copy of your paper, if you can send that to me, please. And uh, thank you also for staying within the uh, five minute limit. We have some questions already. So um, Unless there are objections, I will simply start going through the questions and uh, pose them to the panel. First one is from uh, Jennifer Murtazashvili, who asks, water has been at the heart of many localized conflicts in the Fergana Valley. There has been increased regional cooperation on this issue in recent years, but how has this affected localized conflicts in the Fergana Valley? Um, and I will ask, uh, Dr. Jumaboyev to, to take the first uh, 
attempt at, at answering that question. Uh -huh. uh, thank you for your question. Actually, Fergana Valley is home for more than 30 small transboundary <laughs> rivers, you know, which is shared between Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan. And uh, <clears throat> before, yes, uh, there used to be some conflicts in uh, selected river basins, such as uh, Shahimardansai, which is unregulated. But uh, <clears throat> currently, there is now uh, improved cooperation, uh, cooperation under current administration and the new administration since 2008, uh, to, uh, 2018, you know, there is a lot of efforts, you know, from government of Uzbekistan to improve cooperation with neighbors. And there is already established bilateral commissioners in order to address transboundary issues. Of course, uh, uh, there is a lot needs to be done in terms of, you know, transparent water accounting, and also most of these uh, legal frameworks does not include you know, climate change impact. So uh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, there are a lot of uh, issues is there, but uh, now there is uh, good progress uh, since 2018. There are a lot of improvement on transboundary water sharing and transboundary cooperation. And uh, another good thing is that, you know, we have also documented best practices in terms of water cooperation in Fergana Valley. And our studies indicated that actually there, are, uh, in, uh, there is uh, good cooperation in peripheries rather than at the center. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the small transboundary tributaries, there is a good cooperation because you know there are neighbors and they share uh, a small transboundary tributary. And you know both sides, they have, you know, exchange of trades and you know agricultural products so yeah but uh, of course uh, we need some sustainable practices and some clear uh, rules and regulations for transboundary cooperation uh, which needs to be done uh, in coming years thank well thank you. you very thank you very much for that um, I'd like to ask Philippe if, if uh, from the, the point of view of Enrique if he has uh, any comments on Ghana. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, I think on the overall, um, well, as I also mentioned uh, in my presentation that um, the level of cooperation between the countries has significantly improved. And I think that, that had also a um, well implication, well, positive um, uh, well implication for uh, well, for Ghana Valley. Uh, so I, I uh, well, I think it has been over a uh, well, effect which uh, now uh, well, we can speak about more peaceful processes and uh, less inter-ethnic inter tensions in that region. Well, there are still some border uh, issues and, and sometimes they, um, um, uh, well, there are conflicts between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan uh, in the bordering areas, but those are local things that happened and they not uh, uh, concern the interstate cooperation. So the level of uh, cooperation between the countries will have been improved and, and that will let uh, the things be more positive in Ferdinand Valley. So this is my view, uh, well, as we see it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. Uh, I think we'll go to the next question from Jeremy Cohen. What role has increased Chinese investment in Central Asia played in the region's water security? Are Chinese-backed infrastructure projects at odds with promoting water security and other sustainable development goals? Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Lal Jabayev to, to uh, take a crack at answering that. I'm sorry, uh, this is... I, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So, <clears throat> just to verify, this is about the Chinese investment. Did I hear it right? That's correct. The question is, what role has increased China's Chinese investment in Central Asia played in the region's water security? And are Chinese-backed infrastructure projects at odds with promoting water security and other sustainable development goals? Right. Um, Yes, so this is a, a very important question about the role of the 
Chinese uh, investors. Um, most of this obviously is uh, through the state support. At the same time, it is extremely difficult to evaluate the impacts because of the, uh, how should I say, lack of data um, on uh, what is being uh, done. You know, sometimes uh, there are projects uh, going on uh, in different areas, uh, but then again, the, the, the level of transparency is not as great as I would have uh, liked it for assessment. But nonetheless, we can see that, uh, for example, in the um, agricultural sector, uh, there is um, yeah, at least, uh, you know, in production, um, air, the, the production, uh, the, the land usage um, is definitely something that um, is being, uh, uh, is being, um, invested in by the Chinese and so they bring in the technology you know the sprinklers whatnot uh, in Tajikistan they are engaged obviously in the cotton production but obviously not necessarily completely cotton production in some others but the uh, the, the overall approach is that you know through the Belt and Road Initiative we are essentially looking at uh, the uh, the security the, the securing of the Central Asian region in general, because it is in the interest of the Chinese to have this buffer zone um, around it. And so the security of Central Asia is important. It's not only by the projects that we see, there are also some uh, investments in the military, you know, joint uh, drills and whatnot. And so definitely when it comes to water security, they are trying to trend this line very, very carefully. And so as soon as the leadership change did, did take place, we've seen that through the cooperation, there is already discussions about building a joint hydropower plant between Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. And so um, it's, uh, it's treading it very nicely. Whether it is at, um, at, at odds, um, I wouldn't say so, um, because uh, the sustainable development goals are, they are conflictual among themselves. Uh, this is just my take on the sustainable development goals is that if you're trying to do to grow economically you know unprecedented you're going to get into the mess into the oceans and you know poverty and whatnot and so right. it's a very generic statement that the you know, water security sustainable development goals i think they're going to be conflicts for sure but this is not because of the chinese it's just that the, the nature of these goals is this okay well as, yeah. as Mark twain said uh, water's for fighting so <laughs> um, the next question uh, comes from my former boss, uh, so I have to I have to present this, and uh, I the problem I have is I don't know to whom to direct it. So I will I will read the question, and then I will ask the panel who wants to volunteer. It's from Alice Wells, who was uh, the acting assistant secretary of state for uh, South and Central Asia, and who uh, previously had served in Dushan Bay right after the embassy opened. Um, so an old hand, she asks, is there any framework that addresses the falling Caspian sea levels, which have been dropping since 1995? This is not an exclusively Central Asia issue since the Volga provides the overwhelming majority of the water that flows into the Caspian. How strong are local environmental groups on issues of water? So uh, who wants to answer that? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Uh, Philippe, I see you smiling. Would you like to answer that? Well, not exactly, but it's not a well. It, 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 well, it's a difficult question. I know well about that. Well, for example, uh, well, um, when uh, well, there were some suggestions how to possibly bring water to the Aral Sea Basin from from the Siberian uh, 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 rivers. This is one option. That has uh, well was discussed at some time during the Soviet times, and even um, uh, well uh, it was discussed more recently. But uh, the other proposal was also to look at to bringing Caspian Sea waters in, in, into the Aral Sea basin, and it turned out that the Caspian Sea is lower than the Aral Sea, so uh, it's not possible to bring the water. <laughs> so, but. Uh, well, I think we need to address this issue with the Russian experts. And I know there's a lot of them who do the Caspian Sea things, and especially when we talk about Volga and, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry for that. <laughs> Anybody else have a perspective on that question? 
All right. Um, um, yeah, I'd like just to add a, a, a very sure, um, uh, short point is that uh, our programs in the region are focused on uh, the region itself. Uh, we focus on regional connectivity within the Central Asian countries. There are other transboundary water issues and uh, issues and challenges in the region, and including uh, the uh, the environmental issues in the um, Caspian uh, Sea. Uh, but uh, for USAID Central Asia, our programming is focused on uh, transboundary water uh, cooperation within the five Central Asian countries and Afghanistan. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we'll go to the next question. This one is uh, specifically addressed to Ruby Shamila. Um, can you look, talk a bit more about USA? Oh, excuse me. It's from Venkat Sridhar, who is an associate professor at uh, Virginia Tech uh, down in Blacksburg. Uh, he asks, uh, can you talk a bit more about USAID's transboundary food energy water nexus project that you mentioned? I am curious to know particularly the data and the modeling aspect. Who are the project investigators? I currently work on the lower Mekong Basin developing models and data sets on and the uh, FEW nexus and systems modeling. Any information you may provide on data models and players involved will help me form any future proposals and collaborations. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so our uh, water and vulnerable environment project that just started last month, uh, will partner with the Stockholm um, Environment Institute, SEI, uh, to, build an, to build on existing modeling efforts and integrate two flagship uh, open source system modeling uh, tools, uh, the water evaluation and planning, which is called the WEEP, and the long range energy and planning tool, which is also called the LEAP, so WEEP and LEAP. Uh, these, these tools will uh, enable a powerful water energy and food security analysis and decision support to inform policy and investment decisions. So working uh, closely with uh, basin water organizations, um, small basin councils, large basin councils, and other stakeholders, we will develop the uh, WEEP and LEAP models. Uh, again, that, that would happen in the next uh, couple of years. Uh, so we will develop the models for the two large basins in the regions, the Sir Daria and the Amu Daria. Uh, and, and the comprehensive model will include the hydrology, existing infrastructure uh, and demands, uh, including agriculture, domestic, urban, industrial and, and hydropower for each basin. So um, integrating uh, these, model in, these models will allow simultaneous analysis of transboundary water, energy and food security scenarios, such as ships and flows for hydropower coupled with uh, increased power uh, trading, electricity demands for water pumping and treatment, uh, irrigation, crop choice patterns and uh, other um, uncertainties. So we will use the uh, results from these models uh, and engage stakeholders in what we will call the uh, RDS, the Robust Decision Support Process, to develop scenarios that assess uh, vulnerabilities to water, food, and energy security ac across um, uh, different uh, scales to, to evaluate strategies uh, to address these vulnerabilities and uh, develop a shared vision. Again, I, I just want to emphasize on the power of uh, data uh, in the region and uh, the power of presenting uh, scientific based uh, proposals to the government for, for regional cooperation. So I think that the, the model uh, that the modeling that would be done by the Stockholm uh, uh, Environment Institute would help us uh, in reaching this goal. Over. Thank you very much. Uh, he kind of beat me to the punch. I was going to ask that question. So I appreciate the answer very much. Uh, the next question is from Robert Eichord. Uh, what are trends in water flows and seasonality of water impacts in the two major river basins, and how are these trends affecting policies and regional cooperation priorities? Uh, who would like to answer that? Please. Dr. Gumboev. Uh -huh. Uh, when we look at it, uh, this uh, hydrological behavior of this uh, large tra two transboundary rivers, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, projections made, you know, there were a lot of calculations in terms of how uh, water discharge will be changed, uh, changed during last year and there were future projections and according to local hydromets and, uh, you know, according to projections, uh, there will be a reduction of, you know, 
uh, about 15% of uh, water flow in Amudarya River Basin and about 10% in Sirdarya River Basin. So, uh, of course, there will be implications, you know, because uh, water is the main driver for agricultural production. And uh, there was also a recent study by Karek Institute. They have calculated even losses in terms of monetary, you know, how much will be lost if, you know, because of climate change, you know, because of water scarcity in the region. And uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, climate change and also increasing competition for water and also population growth might be, you know, catalyze cooperation, you know, in these transboundary rivers in the future, which uh, there is still, uh, there is cooperation is going on, but it will, Again, you know, uh, improve, I think, in the future, this uh, cooperation, this climate change due to increase of pressure for water, you know, might uh, significantly increase, you know, uh, cooperation in the transboundary river basins in Central Asia. We have been also working on the one project, it's called uh, Implication of Climate Change in uh, Amudarya River Basin in the socioeconomics economics uh, of this country, Central Asian countries. And uh, our study indicated that, you know, there is, uh, there will be also some reductions in the river floor. And now we are doing some socioeconomic economic analysis, you know, what will be implications for socioeconomics economics of development of these countries. So when we finalize this paper, then uh, we will share uh, publicly this publication. Can I also add, sorry. Please go ahead. Yeah, I just uh, wanted also to reiterate what the previous speaker, Mr. Jamal Boyf, said about the uh, climate change, and um, like as a World Report, uh, World Bank report also shows, like one third of glaciers um, that um, like feed the the Central Asia's river basins might just melt by 2050, and this will of course um, kind of adversely affect the region. And we, we also see some of the impacts because earlier this year, it's because of the very low drops in water levels in Punch River, uh, Tajikistan had to announce that it would just um, uh, suspend the um, electricity, the generation of electricity uh, to Uzbekistan and also restrict its own uh, electricity generation in, in the country. And though the situation um, has been stabilized now, but I mean, the threats are still there. And I think it's really important for the, for the regions to actually think about that and work together to uh, um, reduce the likelihood of this happening again in the future. Um, yeah. Well, I think that uh, we are just right on the cusp of turning things back over to FCON to wrap up. Uh, we're at the five minute mark. So FCON, uh, if you have no objections, I will turn the floor back over to you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, thanks, everyone, for taking time to join us today. Uh, we really appreciate it, and your expertise is highly valued by us. This is our first report on the water management. Obviously, at the Caspian Policy Center, we want to continue working in this uh, area. And I'd like to thank all my colleagues for putting this event together as well. There was one question about the falling levels of uh, uh, water in the Caspian. Uh, this is an issue uh, uh, we want to uh, look more. I, I'd like to have you to have a conversation with uh, uh, Dr. Saprikin, uh, maybe down the road, if we can share some information and some expertise on that. And also, we want to expand our study into the Caucasus as well, uh, because uh, at the Caspian Policy Center, we are concerned not only with the Central Asia, but also Caucasus and the greater Caspian re region in general. And uh, once again, um, uh, please check out the report on our website. Uh, it's a, uh, as I say, it's the first step by us uh, on the water management issue in the uh, Central Asia. We look forward to working with all of you uh, down the road as well. Uh, once again, thanks for tuning in, and we uh, we look forward to seeing you in our future events as well. Akwada, I don't know if you have anything that you want to announce as a next event on the Caspian Policy Center? No, okay. Uh, once again, thank you. Uh, uh, have a great one. Have a great rest of the week.